Hello. How's everyone doing today? Pretty quiet. Can everyone hear me? A uh, quick question before I get started. Do we have any uh, Polish UFC fans in the audience today? I know that's totally random. We're at a tech conference, but uh, we just saw the uh, Joanna Jacek fight last week, and amazing job. Been super impressed with, uh, with how she works in the Antikon. Anyways, uh, today I'm going to talk about how we build tools to power the Netflix catalog. And uh, this is me in bed before my first day at Netflix. I hadn't really used the service very much as a user yet at this point. This was about three years ago. And I was really excited to get started. Um, but I thought about working on the internal tools uh, behind the catalog, and I thought to myself, how, how tough can this really be? Really, all you need is probably like a video file and maybe an audio file, maybe some artwork or something like that, and then poof, it's on Netflix, and people can watch it, right? They're like, how, how, how difficult can it really be to power a catalog for a service like this? Because when you look at your devices, that's really almost kind of all you see uh, as, as, a, as an end user. So I grabbed my laptop bag, and I got excited to go to work the next day. And uh, I, was, I was intrigued to learn a little bit more about how the catalog came together. And I was right. Really, all we need is a video file and an audio file and some artwork. And we also need metadata, like director and cast and characters in the movie and release year and title. We also need to manage contracts and asset rights and windows and you know, things that tell us when titles are allowed to be on the service and when they're not supposed to be. Don't forget about other video encodings for multiple device types and subtitles and closed captioning and dubbed audio. And then all of these need to be like tagged for content, like action or adventure, uh, maybe violence or drama. Um, and then we have to localize all of those assets as well. So it's starting to scale up a little bit here, and I'm getting a little confused. We still have maturity ratings and multiple kinds of synopsis that you know, tell you a little bit about the movie. Um, so if we just looked at artwork alone, that's a huge amount of complexity, which I, I didn't know when I had got started there. We have uh, multiple kinds of artwork on the service. We have device-centric artwork. Um, you'll see different imagery, whether you're on your phone or tablet or on your 10-foot TV experience. Um, you'll see contextual artwork, whether you're seeing that artwork in a, in a banner or if you're searching for something, you may see a little bit of a box shot. Uh, we have localized artwork that um, you know, shows title treatments in multiple languages so that folks can recognize something in, in their own language, like Iron Man or Kimmy Schmidt here. Uh, we can translate that so that they don't have to just recognize the logo necessarily. They can see it in their own language. Uh, new episode badges are something that we also handle from artwork side. Uh, we also have artwork A-B tests. And then uh, there's 50 different kinds of images on the service. And then we kind of multiply that out by all of those factors. And then we multiply all of that out by all of the variations from country to country around the world as we expand. And I started to realize that first week that there's a lot more behind the scenes of Netflix than you really see when you open the app up. So I'd like to introduce you to the team that I work on, uh, Content Platform Engineering, and talk a little bit about um, how we build and innovate on this catalog and some of the challenges and solutions that we've come across along the way and some of the things that we're working on. Uh, the easiest way to describe content platform engineering, where it lives in the Netflix ecosystem, is if we took users uh, who watch movies and put them at one end of a timeline. Actually, let's make that a lot of users, because we just hit 100 million people uh, around the world that, that subscribe to Netflix, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, anyways, we put users who watch movies on one end of a timeline and producers who make movies on the other end of that timeline. Content platform engineering sits right about here on this side by the producers. And there's a lot of other teams that happen along the way of getting that content from producers to consumers. Uh, some you might be familiar with. We have teams that do analytics and reliability. If you've heard of our Chaos Monkey team, we maybe could call them unreliability. Uh, API services, UI and device engineering teams and coding teams. Uh, we can't really get into a, all of that today, so we'll just call that Netflix. And we'll talk about the two things that Content Platform does uh, in this pipeline. They're very distinct. One of them is we make a set of internal tools 
that helps Netflix employees and partners and their contractors, uh, vendors, distributors, and studios, upload assets into the catalog. And the next thing that we do is we provide source of truth data to all of those other teams so they can consume that catalog and do all of the things that they do to bring the service to life for our consumers around the world who um, you can watch at home or on the go with our new downloads feature. Uh, and these two things that we do vary quite a bit in how they affect how we build our tools. So keep those in mind as we're going through some of this. So, as you can see, and as I learned on my first day, there's quite a bit more behind the scenes of Netflix. Um, and I'd like to kind of go through three uh, of the challenges that we've kind of come through from a, from a UI side. Um, and hopefully you find it a little interesting and, and maybe a little familiar with some of the tools that you build. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have to solve for on content platform is workflow efficiency. Contrast to uh, Netflix customers who uh, when they get home at the end of the day, they want to turn on the TV, they want to kind of casually find something that interests them, and they want to just kind of like sink into their couch, watch a good movie, or maybe that next episode of House of Cards. Um, it's okay for all of that information to kind of be present, but almost a background to, background to that decision, and we don't necessarily need them to move very quickly through our UI. We want them to find what they want to watch, we want them to find it efficiently, uh, but that's a little different from how we design our tools under the hood on content platform. Behind the scenes of the customer product experience, um, our users are internal Netflix employees and contractors for, like I said, distributors and vendors and studios. So we have to build tools to help those users work very quickly and accomplish their tasks. And the reason we have to help them work very quickly is a lot of times they're paid hourly or, or by salary. And if our tools are inefficient in the workflows that they do, um, then it's very costly for our partners and for Netflix in order to acquire that content. Uh, anytime we find a user working on a given task that takes 15 minutes, but really it should only take about two minutes or something like that, that's something that we look as an opportunity uh, in, in what we do with our tools to help improve that for them so that they can increase the throughput and effectively increase the number of titles that we can process uh, to get onto the service. But we also have to build tools that help users very accurately accomplish those tasks. And the reasons we need to do that is because if our tools focus primarily on speed uh, and, they, and they don't take accurate accuracy into account, then redeliveries have to happen, mistakes have to be corrected, um, and that can also be costly for Netflix and our partners, but it can also impact our users if the wrong artwork is uploaded to the wrong title or the video files haven't been QC'd properly, et cetera. And we don't want to build something that focuses strictly on, on pushing things through the pipeline um, and leave that to our end users to find all of those mistakes. And then, you know, after a long day's work, they get home, they want to watch House of Cards season five, and it doesn't work. That's, uh, that's an experience that we don't want them to have. And other teams look to our catalog as that source of truth. So we have to be uh, accurate as well. Uh, so some of the solutions that we've explored for workflow efficiency are enabling some safe bulk operations and automating some of the repetitive tasks. Um, we have to identify these bulk operations before we just throw a select all button on the page because we have to account for our backend system capacity. Our backend systems on content platform are designed, like I said, as a source of truth for information. So they have more than just serving the API information out to our UIs. They also have to process and, and send that information downstream. So uh, we can't just overflow them with the ability of saying, like, process these 1,000 requests at the same time. Um, and we also don't necessarily want to do that because we don't want users to be able to accidentally remove thousands of titles from the site. Uh, so we need to make sure that when they do work in bulk, they're doing it in a safe way and that we understand exactly what they need to do, but make it something where it's powerful enough that they can get the tools kind of fade out of the way. Um, but it's not so powerful that they can uh, you know, introduce a lot of human error as they're just running through uh, their tasks. Um, automating and queuing tasks is something that we also have to kind of look into. Like, is there any way that we can apply a given action to multiple other titles? Um, maybe all, all of the things that you might do for one episode of a season would relate to other episodes of that season as well. Maybe they're all rated the same, or maybe they all have the same artwork. Um, anytime our users have to kind of sit there and, and edit every single title is something that we look for and say, how can we make this happen quicker for you, um, especially for related titles? 
another way uh, is to streamline by just simply reducing the number of clicks. Um, in my most recent project, uh, the team worked uh, very closely with users. And uh, the, the users of an existing tool were finding that it takes about 15 minutes. These, are, these were really experienced and advanced users of this tool. It took about 15 minutes and 300 clicks just to enter maturity ratings for a single season for one show. And after watching them over the course of a couple of days, we realized that a lot of these clicks were just repetitive and things that they didn't necessarily continue to have to do. Um, so we were able to reduce, reduce uh, and design a workflow that uh, took those clicks to about 17 seconds end to end for entering these ratings. And it was about 15 clicks total, which really allows our users to improve their throughput and their efficiency when they're working on the catalog. Earlier, you saw that there are a lot of different uh, pieces of data that go into the Netflix catalog, maybe a lot more than I realized when I first started. Um, and it's very rare that our users can work on exactly one space of data at one point in time. Contextual data is something that we have to keep in mind for all the tools that we build, uh, because it helps, make users, uh, helps users make really informed decisions about what to work on and how to work on that. Uh, but because we're a source of truth for all of these elements, the data often lives in different systems, different databases, which means our UIs very frequently need to aggregate that data um, in order to help users know, uh, should I upload artwork for this movie? Is this next season artwork even required in this country? Do I need to lo localize this for this country if it's not going to be debuted yet? Um, we have to be able to gather all of this information as we're piecing these UIs together, and we have to do it quickly without calling into seven or eight different systems. Um, but we also don't want to overwhelm them with too much data on the screen, because they do need to focus a lot of times on one task at hand, but they need to have enough of that information uh, to make those decisions of what to work on, when to work on it, and, and what the most important task would be for them to, to do right then. Uh, if we can't show them this data, Users have to open up many different tabs and click through a whole bunch of different systems uh, in order to find that information. And that reduces that workflow efficiency that we'd like to solve for. It also makes it really difficult for them to prioritize their work because they get lost when they're going in between different applications. Uh, what was I working on? Oh, yeah, I was going to do artwork for this show. But I was way over here in this other tool. Oh, that's right. I needed the synopsis information before I did the artwork. So one of the solutions that we explored is um, allowing for a wide variety of filtering, sorting, and searching. This is a screenshot of one of our source delivery tools. Um, you can see that right now, things are grouped by like assigned date, which uh, allows users to kind of group all of these different titles into different buckets based on when they were assigned to somebody. Um, so we started exploring uh, you know, allowing them to, if we zoom in here, um, select things that they can group by. Maybe they want to group something by movie ID or group all of their delivery requests by a request type. And then on top of grouping things in different buckets and seeing how many requests are maybe due for that, that group, they also may want to contextually set the different columns that they see so that they understand uh, what type of, of source am I delivering? Is it a subtitle or secondary audio? What languages are these for? Is that important to me? I don't know. Um, and if our tools are flexible enough, it allows our users to kind of customize exactly what they see. Um, we can't store everything, though, in our UIs because they're going to aggregate this from different uh, services. So a lot of times, the back ends will cache this information that comes from different services. But we can't keep that just on one back end just for that UI because then it starts to make the source of truth really ambiguous. Does this subtitle, is it coming from the service that does subtitles, or is it coming from the cache in front of it? And we all know that the two hardest problems in uh, computer science, right? It's uh, naming things and cache invalidation and off by one errors. So another way that we're working on uh, solving for this contextual data issue, um, thanks to some upgrades in our tech stack, which I'll get to in a little bit, um, is developing these simple widgets. We call them cards, uh, kind of like house of cards. And these widgets take basic inputs like movie ID, language, and country codes. And then the teams behind that data space can design those to go out and fetch the data based on those inputs and display it in a meaningful way that would make the most sense in that context. And then we can share these cards between our different UI applications. So now instead of our users having to go to all of these different systems and input that movie ID in the language code to find that information, uh, we can take these cards, 
put them into a single application, and our users can say, I want to look at this movie in this language. And then those cards can all kind of be formed on the page uh, per application in a way that makes the most sense uh, for what they're trying to achieve there for that specific tool. Another issue that we've ran into is the product suite. Um, we're trying to design this so that our contractors and employees have a very familiar set of tools to work with day in and day out. There's about six or seven teams on content platform, um, and we want all of these applications to live kind of under one brand umbrella. When I first started, we only had four or five kind of really monolithic applications. Um, so it was kind of easy to keep this um, you know, consistent because we you just drop Bootstrap on the page or something like that, and then everything kind of magically works and looks the same. Um, as we started tearing these down and putting them into microservices, uh, we've grown to about 30 or 40 UI applications to help us manage the, the content uh, in the catalog. And since these tools would be used by lots of different folks on many different teams and companies, uh, we really want to make sure that consistency is key so that we can share that efficiency. If we find in one tool there's a workflow pattern that works for users, maybe that's something we can share in another tool. It also allows us to reduce training time, because if they've seen a workflow like an advanced search bar in one tool already, we don't need to reintroduce that to them. And they, they already can intuitively know this is how this UI will work, even though I haven't worked in this tool before. Um, this is some of how our tools looked before. Um, they, they just felt very internal tooly and very enterprisey. Um, our users didn't trust them a lot. There was a lot of uh, kind of small issues with them. Uh, and they just kind of had this slap together, get things done feel. And we wanted to work uh, on improving that. One of the first things we did was starting assessing our tech stack. Um, our backends, like I mentioned, are these Java REST services, and they manage all of the data coming in and going down to other teams. Uh, our middle tier here, Groovy on Grails, we were pulling in client jars. There was a lot of business logic and very unstable platform builds. And then on the UI, uh, because we had so much work to do on the middle tier, uh, we just kind of started throwing things on globals. And we used Backbone, which is a great framework, but it allowed us to have a whole lot of inconsistent patterns. So moving forward, we knew we weren't going to be able to get to this like, effective, cohesive, consistent product suite with this tech stack. So we made some upgrades. We put Node.js on the middle tier. And we have a, a technology called Newt uh, that is effectively just a, a sidecar that makes uh, proxy calls to these back end services. So we really thinned out the middle tier there. And, and it let us focus more on our UI side so that we could focus on those workflows and those shared components and making that, that suite more efficient. Uh, we also upgraded to React and Redux, which has been great um, in terms of sharing all of those little cards and widgets and stuff. It allows us to kind of declaratively make these, these elements um, and, and share them pretty easily between the pages. But like I said, there's still like six or seven teams on there, and we've kind of been experimenting with all of this. So we have different versions of React in some apps and other versions in other apps still, and it kind of makes it just a little bit difficult. Um, but we're, we're getting there as we kind of continue to push forward and, and evolve these. Uh, like I said, the, um, the goal overall for our suite is that whether you're working in source deliveries or entering ratings for a title or even working on the contracts uh, themselves, we want these to look like a, a set of applications that are all very familiar and similarly designed to help our users work quickly and accurately See all of that data that I learned about that I, I had no idea existed behind the scenes to bring Netflix to life. Thank you.